equilateral triangles are a pain to draw. I mean, go on, grab a piece of squared paper and try it now. I'm guessing you chose two points on the grid, but the third point probably landed at some awkward position, making it pretty inconvenient to draw, right? And well, we're only just getting started. For example, drawing a regular pentagon or dodecagon on a grid with just a ruler feels almost impossible. Perhaps you might think this is only because the shapes we're drawing tend to be quite small. If we have an infinite grid with infinitely many integer lattice points, surely we can find three of them to make an equilateral triangle. And for a matter of fact, surely we can find n points which form a regular n-sided polygon, right? And yep, indeed we can. Look at this triangle with its vertices at the origin, 30, 0, and 1526. It's equilateral. That was easy, wasn't it? Well, almost. In reality, this point isn't quite at 1526. But, I mean, it's really close. Perhaps we just need a bigger triangle. How about this one? Or this one? These are both even closer to having their vertices at integer coordinates, but still not quite there. If we can't find an example of an equilateral triangle with its vertices at integer coordinates, then why don't we just assume one exists and see what happens? What properties of this triangle could we consider? The first thing I thought of was to find some general algebraic expression for the coordinates of this triangle. And this certainly does lead somewhere meaningful, but before diving headfirst into algebra, we should pause to think about what else we could do. Another property we could consider is the area of the triangle. We know that this is just half base times height. If the triangle is equilateral, then the height is a side length x times sine of 60, so the area is root 3x squared over 4. Hmm, okay, what's interesting about this? Well, if the coordinates of our triangle's vertices were integers, then Pythagoras tells us that x squared is an integer. So because root 3 is irrational, the area of this triangle is also irrational. That is, it can't be expressed as the ratio of two integers. But hold on a minute. There's something inherently rational feeling about shapes with integer coordinates. And indeed, you'd be right to suspect such a thing. Imagine drawing a rectangle whose perimeter contains the vertices of the triangle. If you're not convinced that such a rectangle always exists, you can imagine drawing a horizontal and vertical line through each of our three vertices, and then deleting the line which lies between the other two. If our triangle had integer coordinates, then so must this rectangle but this tells us that the area of the rectangle must also be an integer. Also note that this rectangle is built up from our starting triangle, as well as up to three other right angle triangles. These right angle triangles have one horizontal and one vertical side, each of which must have an integer length. Therefore, the area of our equilateral triangle being the leftover shape must be rational, However, remember before we said that the area must be irrational? That doesn't make sense. How can the area both be rational and irrational? The only way this could happen is if no such equilateral triangle could exist in the first place. Whilst that's slightly unfortunate, maybe our look will improve for shapes with more sides. Well, firstly, just to state the obvious, it's no surprise that we can draw a square on a square grid. But what we're really asking is about regular shapes with five or more sides. 
Well, as before, let's suppose we have some regular n-gon, which can be drawn with all its vertices at integer lattice points. We can break down any regular n-gon into n-2 triangles, and as we just showed, the area of each of these triangles must be rational, so the area of our n-gon must also be rational. We again want to find another expression for the area using the fact that the polygon is regular. Whilst finding the area of any regular polygon isn't so straightforward, finding the area of a triangle is. So let's break up the polygon into triangles. The most convenient triangles are probably these identical isosceles triangles with their apex at the centre of our polygon. But what do I mean by centre? Well, if we were to find the midpoint of a line segment, we'd find the average x and y coordinates of each point. The centre, or more accurately, the centroid of a polygon, can be found in the exact same way. So importantly, if our polygon has integer vertices, then the coordinates of the centroid must be rational. Using the same formula to find the area of a triangle as before, we can find the area of one of these isosceles triangles and multiplied by n. But again, by Pythagoras, x squared must be rational. So we're left with the question of whether sine theta is rational. If sine theta was irrational, this would contradict our observation from before, that the area of our n-gon must be rational. So being the optimists we are, why don't we assume that sine theta is rational? But what actually is theta? We divided the polygon into n identical isosceles triangles, so theta is just 360 divided by n. Well, as we might hope, when n equals 4, in other words we have a square, we get the sine of 90, which is 1, and indeed we can draw a square. But as you might also know, sine of 30 is a half. That sounds promising. Maybe we can draw a regular dodecagon, that is, where n equals 12. However, if we could draw a regular dodecagon with integer vertices, then isolating every fourth vertex leaves us with an equilateral triangle. However, we already showed that it's impossible to draw an equilateral triangle with integer vertices, so this must also be impossible. Interestingly, a generalisation of this statement leads to a whole family of proofs centred around seeing whether regular n-gons with an odd prime number of sides are constructible. But we'll continue exploring rationality to get to the bottom of this question. Our angle 360 over n itself is rational, so let's take a moment to think what this means geometrically. If we keep moving around a circle in steps of 360 over n degrees, we'll eventually land back at the point where we started. And this is true of any rational angle. In essence, this is what it means to be rational. Using this as motivation, why don't we just focus on what happens when we double our angle, which is rational? You may be familiar with the double angle formulae for sine and cosine, What's convenient about the formula for cos 2 theta is that it can be expressed entirely as a function of cos theta, rather than a mixture of sine and cosine. This tells us if cos theta was rational, then cos 2 theta must also be rational. In particular, if we write cos theta as a over b, where b is positive and a and b are integers, sharing no factors then we get an expression for cos 2 theta. Now, unless b equals 1, the denominator of our new fraction is larger than our old fraction. But is this fraction necessarily fully simplified? Suppose there's a prime p, which divides both the denominator and the numerator. If p divides b squared, then p must divide b. And if p divides 2a squared minus b squared, then p must divide 2a squared. If p was odd, then p would have to divide a, which would contradict 
A and B sharing no factors, so the only possibility is that P is even, or in other words, P equals 2. Whilst this argument is starting to get quite finicky, what we've just showed is that the highest common factor between the numerator and the denominator is 2. This means that the denominator of the fraction can be simplified by at most a factor of 2. Note that if b is greater than 2, then b squared over 2 is strictly greater than b. So this process of doubling the angle and taking the cosine repeatedly will necessarily generate fractions which, when written in lowest terms, have strictly increasing denominators. In other words, we have a sequence of angles where the cosine of each angle is necessarily different from all the others. But that doesn't make any sense. I mean, just a few moments ago, we said that if an angle is rational, then taking multiple steps by that angle means that we repeat ourselves. For example, cosine of 360 over 7 is the same as cosine of 8 times 360 over 7. More rigorously, because theta equals 360 over n, there are only at most n possible values for the value of cosine of 2 to the power of k times theta as k varies. And there we have it, a contradiction. We have a sequence which must both contain infinitely many different terms, but also be periodic with a period of at most n, and that makes no sense. That means that b must be less than or equal to 2, so the only rational values of cosine, and for that matter sine, are the ones we're all familiar with, 0, a half, 1, minus a half, and minus 1. Wow, that got awfully number theoretic. But why did we do this all in the first place? Well, we wanted to see if it was possible for the area of our regular n-gon to be rational. Unfortunately, we just showed that the sine of any rational angle must be irrational unless n equals 4 or n equals 12. So, in the end, despite our optimism, no matter how clever we try to be about drawing a regular polygon on a grid, we can't do it. Well, unless it's a square, of course. However, the video's not over just yet. As I've been alluding to, this is far from the only proof of this result. I mean, here are a few other proofs that I found just in the process of making this video. But there was one proof which really dwarfed all of these in elegance. So, as a reward for making it this far into the video, here it is. Again, we'll assume that we have a regular n-gon for n greater than 4, with its vertices at integer coordinates. Imagine taking each side and rotating it inwards by 90 degrees like this. This rotation lands us at another point with integer coordinates. And moreover, we form a strictly smaller regular n-gon with integer vertices. But we can repeat this process as many times as we want. Um, hold on a minute. How does that make any sense? There are only finitely many points with integer coordinates contained in our regular n-gon, but we just found an infinite process to generate infinitely many smaller regular n-gon each with their points at integer vertices. And there we have it it's a contradiction. Not only is this proof much shorter than any of the other ones, but it provides a real visual meaning for why all regular polygons, other than the square, are, in a sense, irrational. <laughs>